On February 13th, early in the morning, I was caught up in a very vivid dream. I was in heaven. And heaven was dancing. All of heaven was dancing. Concentric circles doing Jewish grapevine dancing. And I was there too. And I'm watching these scores, no, hundreds, perhaps tens of thousands of people. And on an inner circle, going one direction, the next circle twirling the other, another. And it appeared to me that all of heaven was celebrating. And I asked a question in the dream and I said, why is heaven celebrating? And it came to me, I heard a word in the dream and it said, oh, heaven is celebrating the reception of a king. manifested presence of God was all over me. I wake up and I'm catapulted into a vision. And then I see these thousands of people dancing. I saw two golden chairs here, and two golden chairs there. There was Bob Jones sitting. There was John Paul Jackson sitting. Over here was Oral Roberts. And right there was Kenneth Hagin. And they were all watching the concentric circles of celebration and dance. And they were all nodding their head in approval. Yes, this is the right thing to do. I woke up out of the dream, went into the vision, and then I reached to my phone and I had a text from a man named Dan. I read the text and it read, our friend, the Lord's servant, has just slipped beyond the veil. So I had that dream around 5 a.m. in the morning on the 13th of February. Hello, everyone. Welcome along for Truth. My name is Daniel Long. We're continuing our series on the Kansas City Prophets, and today we're going to be talking about Paul Cain. Now, Paul Cain was a really, really interesting guy because he actually, very similar to Bob Jones, had a vision and a mandate to be a prophet as a child. It's really funny because so many of these guys all have the same experiences. You know, they have these very, or, or, or at least very similar experiences. Bob Jones has his first vision at eight. And Paul Cain also has his first experience uh, with uh, the Lord, or he's called to be a prophet at the age of eight years old. And the same thing happens to, the faith healers as well. It seems like every single faith healer had a some kind of sickness when they were a child, and they were miraculously healed, and so that uh, you know kind of spurred them on to uh, faith to become a faith healer. So it's the same thing. It seems very similar here with Paul Cain and uh, and Bob Jones, both having visions at very young ages. So Paul Cain was born in 1929. And he says that he was converted at the age of seven, seven years old. And um, he says it was a miraculous conversion and uh, that after that, his, you know, he, his heart was changed and he just fell in love with Jesus. And he would go out early in the morning, four o'clock in the morning in the fields, and he would, he would pray and he would uh, just, just talk to Jesus. Well, Paul was commissioned as a prophet, according to Paul, at the age of eight. The Lord uh, seemed to appear in the room, and the room was just illumined with uh, a light above all the brightness of an incandescent light or, or the candles, and it was, it was amber, and just filled the room. It looked like um, liquid gold that you could see through, or amber color. And so I knew the Lord was going to do something. I thought he was going to take me uh, home before I got in trouble or something. You know? <laughs> so anyway, 
uh, I pulled the cover up over my head and began to violently uh, tremble. And the Lord spoke in an audible voice and told me what he, uh, why he had healed my mother and what I was called to do. And at that time, I did not know anything about my mother's healing because she used great wisdom. Uh, she's a very wise uh, woman, and she felt that I should not be told she determined not to tell me about my calling until the Lord dealt with me um, himself, and then she would tell me. So this is what was going on. And the Lord told me what, what I was called to do and uh, that I would never, you know, be the same again. And so the angel, this angel supposedly called Paul to the prophetic ministry said he was going to have a ministry like the Apostle Paul, and he was going to be preaching the gospel. Now, supposedly, he had no idea that his mother also had a visitation from the Lord. He claims that his mother and his grandmother and his great-grandmother all had uh, the gift of prophecy. They were all, they were all gifted in the prophetic. Uh, she was in Baylor University Hospital in Dallas, which, uh, of course, is a Baptist hospital. And uh, they find that she has these multiple uh, uh, afflictions uh, that, that could any one in itself prove fatal. So they pronounced her a hopeless uh, victim of cancer, told her that she had never lived near the time for me to be born, and sent her home to die. Um, well, the angel of the Lord, my mother said it was the Lord who came to her, but we all know that the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is the Lord Jesus Christ. But the angel of the Lord came to her and put his hand, his right hand on her shoulder and said, Daughter, be of good cheer. You will live and not die. And uh, the fruit of your womb is a male child, he shall be born in perfect health, and you're to name him uh, towards Paul, for he will uh, preach the gospel um, with the anointing and in the spirit of the apostle of old. And so my mother was instantly healed. Of course, this was many months later after she was sent home to die. She wasted away. And... Um, the tuberculosis, uh, they used to call that consumption simply because it consumed the lungs. And she was in a, a condition where she would sit up in bed, being propped up in bed, and cough up uh, chunks of her lungs. And she would not speak above a whisper. But when the Lord appeared to her and told her she'd be healed and live and not die, and she'd have a baby boy, well... She started trying to shout and praise the Lord, and my father thought she had lost her mind, not compass minutes. So he went across town. We didn't have a telephone in those days, and he went to get the doctor, uh, the family physician that hadn't seen her in, in uh, eight months, and uh, thought she was dead. So the, Dr. Armstrong came in, and here my mother was sitting up in bed, lifting her hands above her head, which was impossible. Uh, shouting glories and hallelujahs in the name of the Savior and the healer, deliver the world. And the doctor was a member of a, a group that didn't believe in miracles. And uh, so he said, Mrs. Cain, lie down and save your strength. You're dying. And this is where I got my sense of humor. So I'll bring it <laughs> on my mother. She said, Doctor, I don't need any strength to die. And if I am dying... Won't you please let me enjoy myself? Yeah. But she said, I have news for you. I'm not dying. So the Lord Jesus Christ, whose I am and whom I serve, stood by me and touched me and told me I'd live. And I'm going to have a, a baby, and he's going to be a boy. He's going to be in perfect health. And uh, I'm going to name him, uh, as the Lord uh, instructed me, uh, Troas Paul, uh, for he'll preach the gospel uh, like the Apostle Paul of old. I've got a very interesting article from Christianity Today. I actually downloaded the PDF of that magazine. 
It's from January 14th, 1991, and the article is called Sears in the Heartland. You can see that right there um, uh, on the screen there. I'm going to scroll down here. There, Right there is a picture of Paul Kane. And, uh, I, you know, that, that's, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's the pic, that's the artwork there. Um, but there is something and there's, uh, there's John Wimber, Paul Kane and Mike Bickle, but there's something that I want you to see here. Like Jesus and the Buddha, Kane's legend begins with a miraculous birth. Pregnant in her mid-40s, suffering terminally from tuberculosis, a heart condition, and cancer, Cain's mother was purportedly visited by an angel who promised that she would be healed, that she would bear a son, and that he should be called Paul, because he would have a ministry like unto the Apostle Paul. My great predecessor, Cain smilingly calls him. The angel gave her a sign that this prophecy about her son was true, that she would live an unusually long life. Last year, she died at the age of 104. Now, I want you to look here at this uh, next part. Cain received his first visit from the Lord when he was eight. Remember, I, I told you that. The Lord told him he would have a great ministry if he kept himself pure. Paul Cain had alcohol problems and he was living a homosexual lifestyle. Don't know how long, but he was living a homosexual lifestyle. And that came out later on because um, Rick Joyner and Mike Bickle and others, uh, they actually uh, brought that to the forefront. And uh, they uh, tried to get him help for that. And at first, he denied it, and then he did uh, admit that. Now, Paul Cain was actually part of the uh, post World War II healing uh, revival. Praise him. Praise him, audience. Mother, look at me. The Lord is going to heal you if you believe with all your heart. Do you believe? I certainly do. You certainly do. You've suffered a long time, and he's able to heal you. How long have you been sick? About 10 years. You believe he knows about it? You hope so. Well, I think he can prove it to your faith tonight and to your belief. Right? You hope so. All right, Mother, he knows about your blood pressure. He knows about your heart. He knows about your kidney trouble and bladder trouble. He knows about everything that's wrong in your body. And he's going to do something about that right now. You believe it? Now look, you're, you're, you, you, you close your eyes right now. Now look, I'm going to show you. If you believe this new visitation is from God that has come to my life, you do believe that, don't you? I do. You do. I want you to close your eyes and think in your heart. You don't have to use your mind. If, you, if some people know how to think from their heart, I believe you do. You think in your heart what you want the Lord to do for you physically. More than anything else in this world, right now you think what you want him to heal you of right now and see if he doesn't reveal it to me glory to god you believe it <laughs> all right have you thought it yes i know you have and you know what your prayer was to the lord lord heal my vision is that right yes, that is that absolutely right that's right you know the lord showed me that don't you yes i do praise god your sight has been failing for the past few years you haven't been able to see hardly at all out of one of your eyes. This eye right here. All right. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I believe God to heal you now. I demand, through the authority of the words of Jesus, that this cataract on this right eye of the child of God, this cataract shall fade away by her faith in the living working, healing power of God in Christ. Hallelujah! Praise him for it. Now look at it. Hold this other eye. There's no pain in that eye. You can see out of that eye now. Isn't that right? Okay. You can see wonderfully and perfectly right now. Isn't that okay. right? And the pain is completely gone. 
Say that again. The pain has completely gone. The devil always attends our meeting. Would you tell him that? <laughs> Would you tell him that again? Yeah. Is the pain all gone? The pain is all gone. And you can see? I can. Praise God. What are you waiting on? Say a hallelujah. God bless you, Mother. Well, he was one of the revivalists. He knew William Branham. Not only did he know William Branham, he was part of that whole um, that whole entourage that traveled around and would fill in for Branham. Robin and I are doing a video series, John, on um, on the history of IHOP KC. And of course, as you know, part one of the Kansas City prophets was Paul Kane. And right. Paul Kane was a big deal, you know, maybe not as big as Bob Jones was in the beginning, but he was a very big deal to the whole IHOP KC thing. So uh, I sent you a text because I'm thinking, you know, I found an article on newspapers.com from 1954 that said Paul Kane at Madison Square Gardens, another William Branham. <laughs> and I know, I know, John, I know that um, he was a rev uh, one of these post-World War healing revivalists. Right. And so I'm thinking, wait a minute, William Branham, Latter Rain, IHOP, Manifest Sons of God, um, you know, Joel's army, uh, shepherding movement, all this, all this stuff kind of connects. So I sent you a text and said, did Branham actually know Paul Kane? Um, and you responded, uh, with it, with, I, and so I just said, all right, let's, let's, let's do something really quickly. So tell me about Paul Kane. Yeah. So I, I have actually spoken to Paul Kane multiple times on the phone. I don't know if you know this, my website used to be a different domain name, everything was different because I was kind of exploring. It actually began as a journey to try to prove William Branham was true, a true prophet. And yeah. then I transitioned to William Branham historical research when I realized, no, this, <laughs> this was all stage act. You had when mentioned I made that, this on your podcast. And I think you mentioned it. Uh, you were uh, in a video with Steve, you and Charles were doing a video with okay. Steve Kozar. And I think you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. So I made that transition and then I started really publishing the deep, dark, dirty secrets. Paul Kane suddenly contacted me because I think he knew I was going to, I was going to start <laughs> publishing information about him. Right. So I got to speak to him several times on the phone before he died. So tell, tell us a little bit about what you guys uh, talked about. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's interesting. William Branham had this stage act of being very fundamentalist, very hardcore fundamentalist um, in every way. And he appealed to the fundamentalist crowd. And one of the key elements of his fundamentalism was the, um, the theme that he did not respect or permit women to preach in the churches. Yet, um, he had, as you know, female preachers in his church. Mm. His wife was actually very active as speaking, as preaching in the church. I have newspaper articles about this. Paul Kane was apparently there from the time in which there was actually a woman preacher in the Branham Tabernacle. Really? Paul Kane mentioned her. Now, I have not yet found her name. I know that there was a Reverend Sister Bernice Hicks, who was a Sunday school teacher, and she started her own subcult, which is in Jeffersonville, called the Christ Gospel Church International, I think. She was a Sunday school teacher, though, not a preacher. Right. Paul Kane said that there was also a female preacher, which I you know, can't verify. It's just his statement. But um, what I understand from... What I knew about the history of Paul Kane and what he confirmed of the history that I knew is that William Branham was not permitted in some countries for whatever reason. I don't know if they knew about this criminal past or his um, his uh, affiliation with high ranking membership in the Ku Klux Klan, whatever reason, there were countries that he could not go into. And there were also countries that there was a great deal of danger in him going. And according to Paul Kane, which also matches what I had heard, William Branham would send Paul Kane as his proxy into these countries. And so he sends Paul Kane, and Paul Kane kind of just takes his place. He's kind of <laughs> vicariously standing there in for William Branham. There's a letter on my website. Uh, it's published in the October 
1950 voice of healing from Roy Davis, the Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux mm-hmm. Klan, who says that William Branham is my Timothy. So William Branham was Roy E. Davis's Timothy, and Paul Kane was William Branham's Timothy. This is some incredible information. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, it's a big deal. I also, because I had him on the phone and why not, I also asked him about the homosexual question. Ah, and it, how, how, was, how did that go? So as you know, Paul Kane suffered severe setbacks in his ministry yes. whenever it was learned that he was homosexual. Mm-hmm. And he even apo- publicly apologized and admitted it in one of the magazines. I can't remember which. I believe it was Charisma magazine because um, the article right. was around 2005, I think, when that came out. I think so. See, this is of interest because <laughs> I, I think I've told you this. I've kept it secret for a while. We have details that um, lead us to believe, strongly suggest that William Branham was also either involved or he had a lot of, most of the men who were very close to William Branham were homosexual. Not wow. most, but a lot of them. And we've identified some of these individuals, um, you know, through various, various techniques. So, you know, even one of William Branham's um, key leaders in the sect, basically his publicist, Dr. Lee Vale, he called him, which he was not a doctor. Lee Vale mentions these homosexual men that William Branham sur- surrounded himself with. Yeah. So when I read wow. this and then I read Paul Kane was homosexual, I became interested and curious because we also have some recorded testimonies, which I won't get into in this, in this video. But I asked him this question. I, I said, so I'm, I'm curious. I want to learn more about this because I'm interested. And I, I wasn't like calling him out or being offensive. Mm-hmm. I just, I wanted to know more legitimately. Yeah. And, um, on the phone and literally I'm on my computer, I've got you can't see it, but I've got monitors everywhere. I've got like five monitors going. On one of my monitors, I had the magazine article that we talked about up, and I'm reading through what they asked him so I could expand on those. Well, he completely denied the whole thing to me oh on the phone. Oh, my goodness. 100% denied it. And and, so. and yet he was with Rick Joyner, Mike Bickle, mm-hmm. and others trying to, you know, go through some kind of um, rehabilitation for all of this stuff. And he publicly admitted it to Charisma Magazine yeah. Yeah, and, and others, but he totally denied it to you. That's interesting. Very interesting. In later years, William Brennan uh, was saying that my mother's testimony of her healing was it was the greatest healing of anyone that he had ever heard of in all the 20th century and uh, once he prophesied that my mother uh, would live to be a very old woman because of what God had done for her I'm getting a little ahead of the story but a very old woman and he said he turned to me and he said brother Paul you're very concerned about your mother leaving you soon because she was getting up in years thin. Said, Don't you worry. The angel of the Lord says she will live to be a very old woman. My mother was healed of all of those multiple diseases, and she lived to be 105 years of age. Yeah. <laughs> now, Paul Kane, like William Branham, supposedly was able to discern sickness. But not only that, he was also supposedly able to discern sin. Well, when I take a step back and look, look over the last 40 years, I'll make a, a, it's a pretty strong statement, but it's a true one. Bob Jones and Paul Kane were, in my opinion, <clears throat> having looked all across the world many times at the prayer, charismatic movement, the prophetic movement, I have never met or seen or heard of any ministries of the level of those two men and that of the accuracy and the profound clarity that came through those two men and when you uh, brought uh, todd uh, bentley and i together the angel of the lord said you found what you're looking for this is a man without guile just as the uh, the um, man was up in the tree and uh, what was the man uh, behold, um, 
Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. No, no, no. Nathaniel. Behold Nathaniel, in whom there is no guile. And I couldn't believe it when people were criticizing Todd that surely he had some kind of guile in him. And the Lord spoke to me as clearly as he's ever spoken before. And I've stood by the notables and the greats that had the greatest healing ministry of all times. And uh, I've never met anyone that has the integrity and the possibilities of leading this thing into a worldwide revival. But here's the point that would matter to some of you who do not know them or have never seen them. God supernaturally put both of them here, and this was a top priority to both of them, the future young adult worship and prayer movement that would emerge in the days to come. And when I look across the earth, I mean the whole earth, the two men that I don't know that, I mean, I'm sure there's some folks out somewhere I don't know about, but I don't know of any that had this kind of accuracy and magnitude of revelation. And I just want to confer and bless whatever I can do, whatever God has given me to do. I just place myself in an available position to hear from the Lord and to transfer and give to my brother who has given so much to others and so much to me everything you've ever deposited into my life that I didn't know how to give away. I'm giving it to my brother tonight to carry on this revival until the stadiums all over the world have been, uh, have been uh, catching this and have been uh, carriers of it and taking it from one end of the world to the other. And thank you. I've met the new breed here tonight. But the Lord sent them here for such a time as this to, to help us in the early days. But most of the things they said are yet future. They're yet future. They're about, they're our story. There are a lot of stories about Paul Kane, very similar to the stories you would hear about William Branham, where Kane could tell you information about yourself that only you would know. Things like your, well, your address, where you live, um, the sickness that you were struggling with, or even the sin that you were struggling with or that you had committed. Now, folks, a lot of this stuff was just pure parlor tricks. Now, I want to read you a quote from J. Lee Grady's book, What Happened to the Fire? It disturbed me that almost everyone who received these prophetic directives was part of the full-time staff of ministry sponsoring the conference. It also seemed puzzling that all the information Cain received, ostensibly received from God, was printed in a staff address directory that I knew was easily accessible to conference speakers. Surely Paul Kane would not have studied that list prior to the meeting, then recalled the names and numbers to make us think he had revelatory powers. Now, in the article where this quote comes from, it says this, Later on, Grady would interview Kane, who stressed no one has ever proved that he obtains information from any source other than God. Grady also followed up on some prophecies, prophecies um, given and discovered that the ones he checked, most of these predictions not only did not come to pass, some had actually proved to be quite the contrary. When asked for an explanation as to why these prophecies had not been fulfilled, Cain dodged the questions, but through a friend denied any wrongdoing. Now, back in the early 90s, a... Assemblies of God pastor by the name of Ernie Gruen preached a sermon called, Should We Keep on Smiling and Say Nothing? And this sermon really got a lot of attention, because in this sermon, Ernie Gruen exposed Mike Bickle and the Kansas City prophets. Paul came, of course, as you know, being one of those prophets. Gruen ended up writing a 220-some-odd page uh, document it's online. You can you can check it out if you'd like. 
But Ernie Gruen quotes Paul Kane in his report as saying, When I was a young man and first received the anointing, I could smell cancer. I could smell a demon. I could smell different types of sin. They all had a stench. They all had a different smell. They were identifying them smells, th- themselves. You could smell infidelity and adultery. Very ironic from a man who struggled with and participated in the sin of homosexuality. In the next episode, we'll be discussing Paul Kane's time in Kansas City at the Kansas City Fellowship with Mike Bickle and the other Kansas City prophets. But for now, let me just say this. Paul Kane was not a man of God. He was not a prophet. He was not a genuine faith healer. Him being able to smell diseases or smell infidelity or smell adultery or whatever sins he could smell, none of the genuine prophets ever talk about these kinds of things. I mentioned this in the last video, and I'm going to mention it here as well. If you compare genuine experiences that the genuine prophets and apostles of Scripture had with God, and then put them side by side with people like Cindy Jacobs, James Gall, Bill Hammond, Mike Bickle, Bob Jones, Paul Kane, John Paul Jackson, and others. The difference is night and day. Paul Kane was not a genuine prophet. Paul Kane was a false prophet. And you need to mark and avoid anyone who promotes his prophecies or his ministry. Thanks for watching.